And today we have our brother Moffat M. Cargo sharing about the man as a mentor. Allow me now to just give you um, um, a bio data of our speaker, uh, Moffat. Uh, brother Moffat is married to Elizabeth and are blessed with two sons and a girl, Ellis, Aaron, and Ivana. Moffat is an accredited mental health professional. He's an adjunct lecturer at Pan-African Christian University. He holds a bachelor's degree in counseling psychology and has a master of arts degree in marriage and family therapy, specializing in child, adolescents, family, and couples. Moffat has also done family therapy short courses at Trinity Western University of British Columbia in Canada. Moffat draws his wealth of experience from working with families and individual clients dealing with a variety of issues, including but not limited to anxiety, depression, trauma, and post-traumatic stress disorder relationship and family concerns, as well as issues re related to attachment between parents and children. Moffat is a registered member of the Kenya Counseling and Psychological, Psychology Association. He is the founder and clinical director of ProCare Counselors, an organization that offers counseling and psych psychology support services to individual groups, families, and corporate entities. And just the other, the other week, Moffat just finished training a team on counseling here at PBC during a four-week session on Saturdays. And this evening, allow me to welcome our brother Moffat. And let's give him a hand clap of applause as he comes to share about the man as a mentor. And as he comes, I would like the, our senior pastor to come. Pastor Ambrose, if you'd come. And just commit the messenger of the word this evening to the Lord as he shares. Please stretch your hand here as we pray. Father, indeed, we have come to your table. And your table is a table where you serve a word from above. You have brought your servant, our brother Moffat. And dear Lord, we believe and know that today you prepared him for a time such as this. That your anointing may not only rest on him, but flow through him to us as he delivers the word that you have placed in his spirit. Father, we want to say thank you for his family. Thank you, Lord, for his profession. And thank you for the giftings and the talents that you have placed him in your kingdom to serve for a time such as this. And so, Jehovah God, we release that favor and that blessing. And Lord, we pray for ourselves that, Lord, our hearts and our ears may be open to receive that Rima word in this evening. Master, may your Holy Spirit brood and hover upon us and upon the word that will be shared tonight. And Father, we believe that even those watching us online, this word is reaching out to them in a very mighty and very special way. Again, we celebrate your servant and we commit him in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, Amen. 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 Thank you. Good evening. I, I didn't hear you. Good, good evening. I appreciate the Lord so much this evening. I feel humbled to stand before you. I want to appreciate uh, the leadership of the church, uh, Reverend Ambrose, uh, the leadership of Men Fellowship, for giving me this opportunity to come and uh, share with us what God has put in my heart. Uh, this evening, I am glad because I know that the Lord is going to speak to us. Amen. Amen. 
And this evening, I am so delighted because of having an opportunity to speak to men. You know, I heard somebody say that if you know how hard it is to gather people together, if you, if you want to know how hard it is to, hard, or to or rather to have people together, to gather people together, and especially men, the only people who know how hard it is are the touts. You know, feeling that 14-seater matatu. <laughs> it is hard. And therefore, I take it as an honor for us to just come and uh, be blessed together. I was asked to come and speak about man as a mentor. And um, when I think about my own history, um, where I was born and how I was raised, I can only say that sometimes our families um, give us to the society when sometimes we are so much empty in our hearts as far as life is concerned. When I think about a father and a man for that matter, to have somebody to mentor him, I can only say that it's really hard. I looked for one and I think I didn't get even to guide me and to counsel me as far as my career was concerned. You know, those were the days when uh, after Form 4, you are just, I remember I said I want to pursue a cause which I did not know uh, what it was. And the only thing probably my parents could do is to tell me, go to that Nairobi and look for a cause. Ukipata utuabi, utuambie. So sometimes it becomes hard. And um, I want to begin uh, by a statement made by Helen Keller. And she said that the worst thing that being blind is being able, the worst thing than being blind is being able to see but having no vision. The worst thing than being blind is being able to see, but not have vision. And this is so profound. Actually, when I was preparing these notes, my little boy came and uh, she saw the name of Helen Keller, and she, uh, he saw the name of Helen Keller, and he told me, hey, Daddy, I know this person. And I asked him, what do you know about, about her? He told me, she traveled all over the world, and she was blind. And I did not know that actually she was blind. I just bounced on this statement and I, and I loved it. And she says that the worst thing than being blind is being able to see but having no vision. With a clear vision, she continues to say, no ocean of difficulty is too great. Without a vision, we rarely move or we hardly move beyond our current boundaries. And this is so true. That sometimes we have been called fathers. We have been called men. But probably because of where you are coming from, if you are like myself, you are dispatched to the society without any deposits, without being able to have somebody to direct you towards your inner resources so that you can make best use of them and be able to redeem time. This is the work of mentors to guide others and to help others redeem their time. I remember uh, my career path was not all that good because like I have said, I did not know what to do. And I just went and I started pursuing a course in marketing and sales management. Hallelujah. Today I look at myself and I ask myself, where on earth do I really apply this? But the Lord has been faithful. Then after that, got employed. And um, as a salesman, 
And I began experiencing a very strange feeling whereby I did not feel contented. And I began to ask myself, where do I need to go? And I remember I resigned from that job and I went to another school and I pursued social work and community development. Look at this confused fella. I did not know what to do. But thank God because it was while I was pursuing that, that I came across a unit called psychology. And I loved it. And that is how God spoke to me. And I pursued that up to where I am. Don't I deserve a clap, my friends? You know, it, <laughs> growing without a mentor, without somebody to, to guide you. I remember when I was preparing to get married. And I went to my father, whom we did not have a very, you know, boys and their fathers sometimes. Those days, you know, maybe here we are good. But we, we were not very close. And I needed to tell him that I, I have found a girl to marry. And let me tell you, one of the worst things that I experienced is to have something that you want to say, but you don't know who to tell. And you, you find it, it becomes so hard for you to vent out what is hidden in your heart because you did not have that attachment. And I want to submit to us this evening. Fathers and men who are here and not married, soon becoming fathers, you know, the attachment between a child and a mother begins right from day one, when they are in their mother's womb. And I heard Pastor Baby here say that as men, we get introduced to our children. Because for the last nine months, they were with someone else. And you know, they communicate. And it takes work. It is hard work for us men to be able to connect with our children. And especially boys. Because Sigmund Freud says, uh, there's something he calls Oedipus complex. And he says that for a boy and a father, they begin, the boy begins to see, they begin to compete for the mother, the two of them. And therefore, right from the word go, you are like an enemy to your son. <laughs> and therefore, it takes hard work. It takes work. Our attachment with our sons, it has to be worked for. It has to be cultivated. It is not easy. Now, ideally, a man is meant to know how life works. A man is at his best when he is mentoring. When he calls out the best from others. When he fathers the fatherless and ensures that the youth find guidance. That is the only way we can define you or we can call you a successful man. Because success in life, God has taught me uh, throughout the years. Success is not measured by the amount of money that we have in our bank accounts. Neither is it measured by driving the top of the rich cars. And they are good. I am trusting God for one with the dimples. You know the ones? The, I am trusting God for one. But that is not what measures success. Success, and especially for a man, for us men, it is always measured by the amount of impact we have put on other people. Is there an amen to that? That when we invest ourselves in others. And I came across some interesting statistical evidence 
And somebody by the name Bates and Taylor says that 60% of children born during the 1990s, this is in the US, will spend a significant portion of their childhood in a home without a father. The research father says that 70% of juvenile delinquents come from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. This evening, before I came here, I was interrupted, but for a good reason, for a good cause. Because I was called for an emergency to go and help a young man, 20 years, who had vowed that he, has, he must commit suicide tonight. And when I probed the father, I realized that this boy does not have a father. He has grown up um, with his mother, and it appears like they are not in good terms with the family, and he tells me that he has been rejected. And when he talked to his siblings to tell, him, to tell them that he is in crisis, he is suffering from anxiety, and he is having suicidal ideations, instead of responding in a positive way, they began to leave the WhatsApp group. You know, the WhatsApp group of the family. And he was left alone. And he felt frustrated. 85% of children with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. A few years ago, I uh, conducted a study, a research. And I was trying to look at the, uh, the, the research was trying to look at the influence of fathers, the impact or the influence they, ha they have on child delinquency. And I worked with uh, juvenile prisoners that commit a maximum prison. And what shocked uh, I was shocked to find out that a child is able to understand the absence of a father because of death. They are able to understand. They are able to cope. They are able to spring back to their original functioning after that. But it was shocking to realize that a, it is very hard for a child to be able to understand the absence of a father for any other reason apart from death. And I know we are living at a time that we call postmodernism, whereby people are choosing. Our ladies, thank God. Uh, do we have ladies in the house? was able to realize that there is another lifestyle. And for lack of better words, I called it a, a malicious belittling of husbands. <laughs> Do I have a witness in the house? You know, these, these are people who think that they are well educated, they have good jobs, they have enough money, and therefore they can just have a child with whoever comes their way and raise them on their own because they don't want to be commanded around, you know? But let me tell you, my dear sister, and if, you are, if we have a sister here, go and tell others. <laughs> that a time is coming. Na utajiwa hujui. <laughs> a few years ago, I counseled with a young man at Mathari Mental Hospital, a son of a very prominent person, uh, a very prominent lady. And um, we talked. And he told me, I blame my mother. The reason why I'm here is because of my mother. 
and I asked, Kwani, you know, I'm just, in, in my head, I am assuming we don't have ladies here. So, allow me just to say it. <laughs> that my mother, she's the one who spoiled me with money. And you know, because of the fact that you want to cover your absence, hallelujah, you think that money will work for you. And therefore the boy, a high school boy, was spoiled with money, and he spoiled himself. He went into drugs because money was too much. The mother is not around. She is all over the world. And that boy got confined within the walls of Mathari Mental Hospital. May the Lord help us. Now, who is a mentor? This is so interesting. That a mentor is someone whose hindsight can become your foresight. Someone whose hindsight can become your what? Foresight. And you know every time I'm speaking to young people, by the grace of God I counsel with people in our church. By the way, I forgot to say that I fellowship with Sitam, Clay City. And I tell them, there's, there are some people who are called wahengas, and I don't know where they went. <laughs> and these people, they lied to us, and they left. Because they told us that experience is the best. And I am here to tell you that experience is not the best teacher. Information is the best teacher. Because the moment you are informed, unless you are foolish, you will not fall into the same pit that I fell. Buana Sifiwe. And therefore, mentors are called to minister to these people in such a manner. A mentor is a brain to pick, a near to listen, and a push in the right direction. A mentor is a brain to pick, a near to listen, and a push in the right direction. When we are mentoring, when we are with our children at home, do we give them time? Do we listen to them? I was here, like you have been told, uh, some weeks, a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, those of you who were able to turn up to come and uh, get skilled on how to help others, we said that listening is very important. Sometimes I counsel with the people, like I remember one particular case, a lady came to me, and I just listened to her, venting out her issues crying and uh, being so emotional. And then I was not doing anything. I was just nodding and listening and validating her pain. And after a session of one hour, without the counselor saying anything, just to listen, I asked her, how do you feel now? And she told me, I feel relieved. I asked her, what has made you feel relieved? Because you listened to me. I have not been listened to in such a long time. Some of the people that we have around at your workplaces, in your families, they only need someone to listen to them. So listening is so key. Mentors bring the richness of experience. That is why I said that information is the best teacher. You don't have to experience what your father experienced. He should be there to tell you and to guide you and to mentor you. Then I found another very profound statement that mentors are emancipators. Mentors are emancipators. And what do they do? Freeing struggling people. Setting free. Or freeing searching people from poor judgments or making bad choices, clouded futures, personal uncertainty, to gain a rich vision of life in Christ. Wholeness, health, joy, and peace. That's a mentor for you. Looking at the role of mentors, and I, and I love this, role of mentors, to invest in others. Investing yourself in others. 
Dear friends, I came to realize that being rich is not having money. The only time we shall come to you as a person who is rich is when you learn how to share yourself, learn how to invest yourself in others. Buana Sifiwe. About 13 or so years ago, we lost our mom. And uh, she's, she was a teacher, just a mere primary school teacher back in the village. I am sure by the time she passed on, she was not earning more than 6,000 shillings. You know primary school teachers, those, those years. Kabla hakietu ikuje, you know? Those years. But I want to say that I got to know who my mother was when she was being buried or when she fell sick in a subsequent burial. Because there are so many people who came. As a matter of fact, one of the things that shocked me because I brought her body here at Chiromo, I began receiving calls from people because we had uh, you know, announced her death on uh, both print and electronic media. And I began receiving calls. And one of the calls that shocked me was a group of women who were her pupils in high school, you know, many years ago. She began teaching in 1963. So she's, she was an elderly woman. And uh, they came to Chiromo and they said that they wanted to view her body. Then I received a call from the mortuary. They asked, there are some people here. You know, they will always ask, uh, some of those questions, who are you, and stuff like that. There are some people who, here who want to view um, your mother's body. And I talked to them. They told me, you don't know us. We were your mother's pupils in primary school. And when we learned that she is dead, we decided to come. can't remember where they had traveled from. And just come and view her body. Calls began coming. But before then, before she passed on, a lady came to ICU Kenyatta and she began scrolling and screaming and making a lot of noise and we were like, we thought we are the children, so <laughs> what's the big deal? And she told us, I know, and you know she's screaming, I know you don't know what your mother did to me. Many years ago, I was at the verge of death. I was about to commit suicide in Form 2. And my mother went running to your mother. And she shared her predicaments. She had locked herself in the house and she wanted to commit suicide upon realizing that the mother, the parents are not able to take her through school. And that woman, may the Lord rest her soul in peace went to the bank with her meager income and she took a loan and paid upfront school fees for this girl up to the time she did her fourth form. She deserved a clap. <clears throat> to be a mentor is to invest in others. Tell your neighbor, invest in others. <laughs> to be a mentor is to be available. Be available. Be there. To give people freedom. Give them autonomy of choice. But inform them. To give affirmation. They see the beauty of others and affirm it. Don't, like, don't be like the people who will always point out to your mistakes. By the way, do you have such people at Parky? You know, people who will just look at what you did not do best. And some of the things that are making our children to even commit suicide is when we as fathers and parents, we are not able to point out to what they are good at. We only point out at what they are not doing best. May the Lord forgive us. May the Lord bless us. <laughs> to
to love others unconditionally and to believe in others. Mentors do not just invest and pour themselves into others. It is Christ that they pass on, helping others to find the same freedom in Christ. They so much appreciate. Salvation is personal, but you cannot keep it private. Buana sifiwe. Salvation is personal, but you cannot keep it private. The moment you keep it private, it loses its taste. It becomes irrelevant. So we lead others to God. Let's look at God as a mentor, Father, as our role model. God presents himself as a father because we all know what a father does. What a father is and what he does. Throughout the Bible, God describes his love for us as that of a caring parent. You can, uh, you'll be given the notes. You don't have to worry. Isaiah 49, 15, John 16, 26 affirms that. But there are some scriptures here I want us to, to read together. God as a mentor. In Matthew 3:17, uh, chapter 12, again, and verse 18, and also repeated in Luke 3.22, the Bible says that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You remember that scripture, Jesus, when he was being baptized, a voice came from his father in heaven and said that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John 10.30 says, I and the father are one. I and the father are one. Jesus is talking. But I loved John 5, 19. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. Whatever the father does, the son also does. And I have an example here. When I was growing up, my father was a smoker. Um, and I really used to admire. You know, let me tell you, fathers. <laughs> may, may the Lord help us. I, I, I really used to admire the way, you know, the smoke coming f from the nose. Yeah? And then putting the cigar here and the, this other side of the mouth, he is talking. Yeah? And a cigar iko hapa. And you know, he kept telling us, thou shalt not smoke. <laughs> but he is sending us to the shop to buy a sportsman. He used to smoke sportsman. Eh, kimbia kwa duka. Dakika moja ni kuone hapa. Sigara na kiberiti. So I really used to admire. But you know, I was at that point of dilemma. You know, if I smoke and he says, that I should not smoke, yet I see him smoke. You know, I really used to feel like I didn't need to try this thing. And uh, I remember one time, and I have my last born brother in the house. Yes, Cyrus. He fellowships here. So, I, 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 I really used to admire, you know, doing like him. And I want to tell us parents, do not worry and if you are writing, you can put this down. Do not worry that your children are not obeying you. Don't worry that your children are not obeying you. Instead, worry that they are watching you. <laughs> are we together? Worry that they are watching you. So one day, to cut the long story short, I'm sent to the shop to buy cigars. You know, I was a very obedient boy, unlike Cyrus. So, but... <laughs> So to the shop, and on my way back, you know, a cigar, a sportsman, and a matchbox. On my way back, I found a cigar. Somebody dropped a cigarette. And I still remember to this day that it was embassy. You know, embassy, embassy, and they used to be smoked by those people, you know. <laughs> eh? And I said, lo and behold, this is the moment. Because this one, I must, I must get to know. I must exercise. I must practice what I see my father. 
Unfortunately, when I, spoke, I smoked, I did a puff, I realized it is not all that, um, you know, interesting. I, I, I had a headache, and I felt like dizzy, and I said, this thing, I don't want it. Thank God, I felt that way. <laughs> so Jesus is saying and affirming that whatever the Father does, the Son does. This is Jesus talking. Now, look at this. God was saying to Jesus, I am proud of you, son. Well done. Good job. Okay? Remember during the baptism? Clearly, God set an example for all of us as fathers. People grow, mature, and reach their potential as they are affirmed. People build much of their sense of self-worth based on affirmation or lack of it. Fathers and men alike are better placed to offer this affirmation. This is very interesting. I, I would want to ask the media to play for us a clip. Um, I want us to watch this clip for about three minutes, and uh, then we see, um, we hear what is coming next. games in 1992 and when he was just about to complete his race he got an injury and uh, not observing 
security protocols. His father, somebody say father, did not care who else was watching, did not care what security protocols needed to, observe, to be observed, but he dashed to support his son. May the Lord help us. Now, everyone, that's what I learned from that clip. Everyone needs a cheering section. Affirming your child counts more than a stadium full of other people cheering him up. When a father affirms a child, like what we are hearing, God affirming his son, when you affirm your child, it counts more for more than a stadium full of other people cheering him up. Children get enough harassment and negative input from the society. Men and fathers alike need to counteract that negative input and not add to it. Listen to these words that uh, 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 Derek Redmond said to the media, that everything I had worked for was finished. I hated everybody. I hated the world. I hated hamstrings. This, I believe, was his coach. I hated it all. I felt so bitter that I was injured again. I told myself I had to finish. I kept hopping round. Then with a hundred meters to go, I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was my old man, the fa my father. Then his dad responded and said, I am the proudest father alive. I am prouder of him than I would have been if he had won the gold medal. It took lots of guts for him to do what he did. Are you hearing the father affirming the son? And you know, it doesn't matter how old your son is, you are still the father. Fathers are mentors. Families are like flocks of sheep. Children like lambs. They are naive and simple in their understanding of the world. Fathers are like sheepdogs, guarding the flock from marauding wolves. We protect our families from human predators and from corrupt television programs. Movies, music, books, friends, and other people or influences that enter into a child's life. Now, this is interesting. Sheepdogs come from the genus of wolves. It takes one to know one. Because you have been there as a father. Maybe you had been a wolf some, some times back. <laughs> but nevertheless, because you have been there, it takes one to do what? To know one. So when those marauding wolves are coming and they want to endanger the lives of your children, you are able to point it. You are able to notice it. You are able to know it from afar. And you are able to counteract it in an atmosphere of love and caring. Mentoring is beyond the narrow conception of father's role as providers of material needs. Fathers, children do not need presents. They need our presence. When I and another time, this, this will come another time. If, you know, I have to be careful. But I want to say this. You know, children, there's something I, I was teaching, those of you who had the privilege of sitting under my voice. I told them there is something we call, or I call the shifts of power in the family. And when we are young, as men, as fathers, we do not know how to distribute that power amongst our wives and our children. Can the few women say amen in this house? We do not know how to share that power and a time comes in life when you cannot take that whip and whip your son and you realize that you have lost it all. That is a topic for another day. <laughs> the quality of father-child relationship is perhaps the most important single determinant of child's attitude and behavior. God talks of widows. This is interesting. He talks of widows, orphans, and the fatherless as his special people who need special care. That is Psalm 68 and verse 5. They are all missing one thing, a male figure or a father. You know, I have read the Bible and I realized 
unajua there are some people wako tu na tabia tu when they realize that a certain lady is a widow wanataka hata kusukuma mpaka you know pale kwa mpaka ya shamba yao wanataka kumfinyiria i realize that it is noted and recorded in the bible that thou shalt not do that okay he talks about orphans he talks about widows he talks about the fatherless nikatafuta mwanaume mahali ya mungu ameongea kumhusu si kupata it is because we are expected to take a position and do something and protect those people that are who are vulnerable fathering is at the heart of masculinity of what it means to be a man god chose the masculine word father for himself because it denotes strength it denotes protection and it also denotes provision that is a father for you the masculine word even if we did not have earthly fathers who treated us well we have an intrinsic understanding of what a good father should be we all have a need to be loved cherished protected and valued ideally another father will meet those needs so it is upon us as men to go out and reach out to those people who are perishing those young men the other day i was i felt sad when i saw a man who has a good job earning good money but because of the pressures of this life he took his life we saw that in the news headlines didn't we it's because we need some people who can start with us at your workplace in your family in church where are we to be found to be able to support these people who are struggling who need our support there isn't much of anything in life children can't face with a dad's strong hand wrapped tightly around theirs this is to weber a father receives his power from god and from his own father did you hear that that a father receives power from god and from his own father fathering is not something perfect that men do but instead it is something that perfects men bwana sifiwe that fathering is not something perfect that men do but something that perfects men we need to be found there with our children now there are two ways to recognize power of a father i'm talking about the power of a father there are two ways number one, to see it at work and number two, to measure what happens when it is gone did you get that to see that power at work when you are present and to measure what happens when the man of the house is gone either way a man is pretty potent present or absent one of the things that shocked me with my respondents at committee was this 13 year old boy i was questioning him and i was asking him what made him to come to prison and he told me i have been i he told me i killed my father and you know when i looked at this boy 13 years questions began running through my mind ulimuua akisimama ama kama ameketi because i could not and he told me he kept on seeing his father molesting them molesting the, the mother and he kept asking himself what will i do to eliminate this problem from this home and of course because he came from this um, low end estate he was advised by his peers that there is a place we can take you and they can hire you a gun and he was taken by then i think he was 11 years before he was put in and was taught how to use it and one evening came and the father came as usual making a lot of noise eh and shouting from the gate hapa ni kwa nani how many of you were brought up in such families hapa ni kwa nani and if you are like myself you come from where i come from they used to ask oko ne kwao and sometimes i see there is anybody who is refuting that this is your home <laughs> and unfortunately this boy shot his father because we say in psychology that children are complete human beings 
The only difference between them and you is that they are clothed in a child's body. They have feelings, they have thoughts, and they are able to see, and they are able to make their own conclusions. We need to ask God to help us. If a man sexually molests or abuses his son or a daughter, the abuse come, becomes a transgenerational family pattern until someone courageously breaks the cycle of pain. Breaks the cycle of pain. We need to ask God to help us. Because I have realized that some of us struggle because even where we come from, our backgrounds, our family of, families of origin, they are speaking. There is a nota that is speaking against us. And therefore you realize there is something you cannot do. There is an extent you cannot reach because there are some voices that are speaking against your prosperity. One of the things that I tell primarital classes, which I have the privilege to oversee in our church, is that God is interested in generations. And the enemy alike is also interested in a generation. And therefore, it is important for us, for such people to sit down and get to understand what kind of altars they are fighting from their families. And God um, made me have this interesting uh, revelation. He told Abraham, leave your people to a country that I will show you. Leave your country. And when I was thinking about it from, in the context of family therapy, and as a counselor, I realized that Isaac could not have been born in a family that worshipped idols. And I realized that there are three aspects of living that God wants want us to live, even as human beings. And aspect number one, and this is one thing that I tell uh, these guys who are preparing to get married, that aspect number one of living is leaving your people emotionally. You know, that disconnect. So that your family can stand. Number two, even geographically. This issue of getting married, I'm speaking now to the unmarried. Getting married and a stone through distance is where you go to live with your wife. May the Lord deliver you from that. <laughs> God told Abraham to a land that I will show you. In other words, it's like he even wanted him to lose track of his geographical origin. Number three is the aspect of spirituality. Living. Because Isaac, there is no way God could have allowed Isaac. And he, he knew that it was going to be in this lineage that the Savior was going to come. And therefore, he had to leave his home where they used to worship idols and go to another place so that Isaac can be born. Sometimes we pray and we cry before God. But unless we come to a point of asking God, what are some of the things that I need to stop so that my miracle can come today, then you realize that it will take a lot of time the same way it took time for this couple to have their child. The men, men who father intentionally and put their children, children's need ahead of their own start a legacy that snowballs with the positive ramifications down the centuries. A father who affirms his children gives them the gift of confidence and self-esteem throughout life. It's part of the power that God has given men. It's part of the power that God has given men. When dad is not around, a child is forced to face the harsh world alone with no one in his court who understands his heart. Someone to empathize with. A child who lives within dad's protective sphere of, sphere of influence finds a safe refuge where he can regroup, lick his wounds, and heal, and move on. Time is failing me. I need to conclude this. In conclusion, we need to share our lives with others. Walk beside them. Be a mentor. Reproduce ourselves in the lives of others. Be willing to be involved in the life of others. Be willing to invite others to learn and study with us. Our power is in the present. Nothing ex exists except the now. I would want you to tell your neighbor this statement, that nothing exists except the now. 
The past is gone and the future has not yet arrived. The past is gone and the future has not yet arrived. Exercise the power of now. Tell him again, exercise the power of now. Because we are not yet in our future. And you know, the media has got its way of making us want to live in the future that we are not there. They begin selling to us plots, plot, maguta, maguta, and, and, and you realize that people become so helpless because you are thinking about what you don't have. Some of us are haunted by our history. We are stuck in our failures. We are stuck in some of the words that our fathers and our mothers spoke against us. We are in the past. We only look at what we don't have. As I conclude, one day I was standing in our church compound, just along the highway, and I saw this man walking and looked like he is in a very deep thought. Very deep thought. Like he's talking to himself. And uh, all of a sudden he realized there was a church and he came in. He came and asked, can I see the pastor? I told him the pastor is not around. Can I help you? And the man just began to break down. He told me, I have walked all the way from, I think, Juja, and along superhighway. And while I was walking, I was thinking of how I'm going to, you know, hit myself against a speeding vehicle and just die. I am at the end. And I asked him, what, are, what is happening? He told me, I cannot afford to see my family suffer. My children suffer because I don't have a job. I was sucked. And then there was an opening somewhere. Some people needed a driver. And while I was on my way to go for that interview, I carried my certificate and took a border border. But little did I know when I arrived that my certificate fell off the border border. And I felt I have come to my end. I have suffered, I have struggled enough. And I listened to him. And I told him, the worst thing that a man can ever lose is not even certificates. It is not even your job. It is not even your friends. The worst thing that a man can ever lose is hope. The worst thing that a man can ever lose is a vision. And I told him, you need to gather yourself again. You need to stand strong because God is on your side. And I invited him again to, the, to our church service. I gave him a bus fare. He went back home. Then he came, uh, and I also told him that he also needed God to help him navigate through the issues of life. So on a, on a midweek service, he came to church, and he gave his life to God. He got born again. I prayed with him. Two weeks after, he called me from Uranga and he told me, Moffat, I am so excited. I am so happy. I asked him, what has happened? Because I have secured myself a job with Kenha. He, how I got myself here, I don't know. And I told him, God can take you where your certificates cannot take you. He can take you there. He can take you there. Because he is a God who does wonders. He can take you. The other day I went to help to cancel with uh, a certain company, Toyota Kenya, they were downsizing. And I will never forget about this man who came to my office. And I asked him, he told me, I am broken. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yes, I am being given this package to go and start life again. But I am just down there. I don't know what to do. In my 24 years of service in this company, I have never known anything else. Na nikakuja kujua, kumbe success si pesa. Yani milioni kadha. Na milioni kadha tu, and you don't know how you're gonna, you know? <laughs> of course, I, I did not say that, but that, that is something that was running through my mind. Okay? We need God. We need God to help us. The Lord is faithful. And the moment we are able to stand and speak to others, mentor others, encourage others, the voice of a father, the voice of a man. The other day, the Sunday school teachers in our church made an appeal to the church that they need men in Sunday school. And they said, you know, we don't want them to come and teach. 
You know, you know how we fear to engage with more children. Eh? We are not calling them to come and teach. We just want them to come and stand there so that the children can behave. And for sure, one man gave a testimony. <laughs> he did not go there to teach. He just decided to heed to that call. And he went in one classroom and uh, took his son and just stood. I want to tell you for a fact, no single child <laughs> made movement, you know, here and there because of the power of a man. May the Lord bless you. God bless you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much, Brother Moffat. Let's appreciate him once more. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah.